Hi guys, welcome to part one of our cruising tips series in the Caribbean. For those that haven't seen our cruising tips so far, where we covered the Med and the Atlantic Crossing, this is a series that we put together in the hope to give you the information we wish we had before we started cruising some of these areas. The intention of them is to give you a general overview and just some really helpful tips on logistics, things like where to get food, where to get water, what are the best places, what kind of boat supplies you might need, how you could prepare your boat better for those places, and to maybe give you a little bit of a comparison between those different areas. Because we haven't cruised the entire Caribbean or the entire Mediterranean, these are snapshots, and the intention is simply to give you an idea of what it was like for us to sail there in comparison to other places. So if you haven't checked out the ones so far, check out our ones on the Mediterranean, check out our ones on the Atlantic Crossing, we're gonna dive into the Caribbean. And after that, we're gonna cover like Panama, the Galapagos, the Pacific Crossing, uh, French Polynesia, uh, all the way back to Oz. So yeah, I really hope you find these videos interesting, informative. If you have any questions, comments, chuck them in the comment section below as we're going through the movie. Make sure you give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So guys, let's jump in. So in terms of the Caribbean, we only got to explore from St. Lucia to the BVIs, which is generally referred to as like the Leeward Islands in the Caribbean. So we can't say that we got to explore the whole of the Caribbean, but what we did explore was a really great cruising ground and we really, really recommend it. In summary, it was really easy sailing with the consistent trade winds that were blowing throughout the Caribbean. You were generally in the calm lees of the island and then you had short crossings between each island, generally a day sail which made traverse into different islands really quite easy. So we didn't have to do any overnight passages and could travel between each island during the day. Because you were in these trade winds as well, you generally had really great weather windows. You weren't hanging around for days waiting for the right weather. You could often just shoot off in the morning, you'd be there by mid-afternoon and you could settle into a nice calm anchorage. Each island and each country is so different. You could simply sail 20 miles in one direction and have a completely different culture and atmosphere an offering from that island. And that was something we really loved about it. We found the Caribbean culture super fun with their reggae vibes, really cool music and food. You know, we really started to enjoy the different types of cuisines, the different types of food. And one thing we really loved was all the street food. It was something we didn't find that existed so much in the Med, which was more restaurants and things like that. But there was so many food trucks and vans and like little barbecues on the side of the road and stuff. So we can really recommend trying some of the local foods. You're generally anchoring in like a tropical paradise. You know, unlike the Med, there was far more water activities, really great snorkeling just off the boat, generally pretty good reefs. I have to say some of the reefs weren't in the best condition compared to now in the South Pacific, but there was definitely heaps to see. Lots of long sandy beaches, pristine water, really nice anchorages, and yeah, what can I say? Coconut trees, it was awesome. One of the negative sides of the Caribbean was actually the poverty that we found on a lot of the islands. It was something that certainly took me by surprise. I didn't actually turn up to the Caribbean with a preconceived idea of what to expect. But one of the major reasons for this was simply Mother Nature. You know, I, I really underestimated the toll that the hurricanes and cyclones have on these places and how hard it is for some of these places to rebuild. And when you're there and you see the scale of devastation, it really is mind blowing. Even two or three years on, these places are still trying to just reestablish basic infrastructure. So what does this mean for your cruising experience? Well, for the islands that were affected, it definitely means that your cruisers are a pretty major source of income and is definitely an opportunity for the locals. Besides, I guess the cruise ships that are coming in and the small amount, and the small amount of tourism, yachts do make up quite a large chunk of their income. And places such as Dominica really thrive on serving the yachties as they come through. So at times you definitely do feel like you're being preyed on a little bit. You can sometimes sense the desperation of where you are. You can definitely see around you that these places are pretty run down, they've been hit hard, and you can kind of feel that they are taking advantage of you. 
but it's also an opportunity for you to support them and support them by investing in their tours, taking a mooring, um, eating their foods, that kind of thing. Obviously, it's not something you have to do all day, every day, but it is an opportunity for you to support these islands where you can. A really good example is in Dominica. Um, in the two main anchorages there, in the north and the south of the island, the locals have installed mooring buoys. And one of the major, major reasons for this is there is so much debris on the ocean floor that a lot of people are failing their anchors. So the locals installed their own moorings there and tried to really make an opportunity for the yachts to stop and take a mooring and obviously pay for that. They were pretty cheap, super worthwhile. Uh, it definitely made us relax about leaving the boat out there that they were on the mooring. When we were there, the moorings were in really good condition but I would definitely recommend checking the moorings if you can um, because yeah, you know, you don't know how old they're gonna be, what kind of rope, what kind of shackles and that stuff they used. So I'd really recommend checking the moorings and if you feel comfortable, taking them. Support the local community. So in conclusion, just be prepared to witness and experience a bit of poverty and help out the locals where you can. You know, utilize their local knowledge, go on the island tours, you know, they are so proud of their islands and so proud of what they are able to achieve that there is really a lot to see and do in these islands. The Caribbean also really represents an opportunity to get off the beaten track. There are so many places that you could only explore on your own boat. Uh, unlike the Med, which we found there were no secret spots anymore, the Caribbean was full of them. And it was a real opportunity to get out there get isolated, get remote, and be the only yacht at an anchorage or at an island or at a little reef or something like that. So really look forward to that because it's a great part. One tip is definitely invest in the cruising guides. We use the Doyle cruising guide and it was great. It was really, really good information. They're updated every like year or two and it really did provide information that we would not have been able to get anywhere else. So I can really recommend investing in the cruising guides to the Caribbean. They're generally split up in the Wimwood Islands, Leeward Islands, and then like the BVIs and whatnot. So definitely invest in the cruising guides. It'll pay absolute dividends and it'll get you the GPS waypoints and it'll tell you those little secret spots that you would not be able to see anywhere else. So that's a summary of the Caribbean. Let's get into a bit more specifics. So from November to April, it was generally really great weather. It was consistent trade winds, making it easy to tra traverse between islands. Uh, it made it really easy to anchor and to predict what was gonna happen. It was generally super sunny, super warm. Uh, you did definitely get a few showers when you're in the lee of these islands. Um, and that often depended on the height and size of those mountains, but it wasn't something to deter us. Outside of November to April, you're starting to get into the hurricane season and you really want to have a plan if you're going to be hanging around. So either avoid the area or have an action plan of some hurricane holes or islands that are outside of that hurricane zone. We found that the grid files provided on Predict Wind were pretty spot on. Uh, we were downloading them using the Iridium Go on the sat phone. Uh, we diff we definitely did have Wi-Fi and 3G in different places, which I'll get onto later. But yeah, we found Predict Wind pretty spot on for all our weather models and weather needs throughout the Caribbean. The one thing that it did lack was, I guess, the local information that we were used to kind of getting in the Mediterranean. You know, often the marinas and the local coastal patrols and stuff would have local weather information. Um, we really didn't find a lot of this in the Caribbean, so we simply relied on those group files. But when you're sailing around these islands, you are 99% in the lee of the islands. It is generally really calm. You will often get some pretty strong catabatic winds coming over the mountains. You know, you got the trade winds that are coming up and over the hills. So sometimes it can be a little bit unpredictable and you'll get random rogue gusts and whatnot but in general, it was really nice calm sailing conditions. In between the islands, it was definitely a little more rough and you were then exposed to the trade winds and the Atlantic swell. And obviously on the windward side of the islands, which is like the eastern side of the islands, you are there in the Atlantic Ocean. So at that point, it's pretty turbulent. So you're generally avoiding sailing on the windward side of the islands. You're always sailing in the lee and you had these sort of 10 to 
30 mile passages between islands, which could be a little rough at times. One thing I will say is be careful around the ends of the islands. This is where you often found uh, acceleration zones where the 20 knot trade winds would often increase to like 30, 35 knots for a pretty brief period. It definitely would take you by surprise after doing, you know, a nice 20 mile passage in a really nice consistent 15 to 20 knots. You can see the anchorage, you're about to get there and you come around the island and all of a sudden you hit with like 30 knots. So just keep that in mind. Uh, keep an eye out for, you know, really dark patches on the water and just consider that on the ends of the islands for these acceleration zones. But what can I say? It was generally really great weather, really predictable and made it a breeze for navigating the caravan. So immigration. What can I say? Just like the Med, every country has a different process. Some easy, some really long and drawn out. I'd have to say it was generally really cheap for immigration. It would only ever really cost us between say 10 and $40 a person to uh, check in and out of these countries, which was pretty good to the Caribbean in terms of having to pay for cruising permits and stuff, which we generally didn't have to do. But some places were really easy like Martinique. In Martinique, you could simply go into like a chandlery. Some of the cafes even had them. You could go into the computer, simply fill it out online. It maybe took you five minutes. Either cost you zero dollars to like five euros and it was done in like 10 minutes. Super easy. You didn't have to go to any customs or immigration or anything like that. All done online. Other places like St. Lucia, of course, you had to go to five different departments. You had to go to the health, you had to go to customs, you had to go to immigration, you had to go to the police, uh, you had to go to quarantine, and of course you had to get letters, stamps, forms from everyone, and it was a little more drawn out. St. Lucia probably took us about two hours to clear in, about two hours to clear out. It was a little bit painful, but wasn't that expensive. The most expensive was the BVI's. I don't even know why it was that expensive, but just do your research before you arrive. The information is all there online. It's easy to access, but just have a little research before you arrive. Also, make sure you do your research as to where these places are. You know, again, turning up to these foreign countries and these foreign ports, it's often pretty hard to figure out where the exact location is of these offices. So check out your noon sites, check out the cruising guides. It has the information there. It'll have maps as to where to go and it'll make it so much easier when you're turning up to a foreign country um, and you're not exactly sure where to go, you might not have internet. Um, so yeah, take some screenshots on Google Maps or something like that of where you have to go, where you're thinking you're gonna be anchoring, and then that way it'll be super easy when you arrive. Thanks for watching part one of the Caribbean. Guys, if you've enjoyed these videos, please give us a thumbs up. Please leave a comment below for me and for the other cruisers out there if you have any other comments, questions, queries, or information that could help other people, make sure you drop it below. If you have not subscribed already, please subscribe now to allow notifications for more of these movies. And if you want to support the journey, consider becoming one of our patrons and supporting us through that. I really hope you're enjoying these and I hope you're looking forward to the next ones coming out soon. Until then, bye guys.